Guten Nachmittag. Uh, vielen Dank mir uh, zu dieser Konferenz eingeladen zu haben. That's all I would say in German. I'm sorry, I don't speak German, but I tried my best. I hope you understood me. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, see the, I see the slides. Okay, so let me talk uh, about Carbios and where we are playing. We are in totally different gears. We are working on plastics and textile um, pollution and end of life. The company is a biotech, so it's full of scientists uh, and gemologists. Um, and it was founded a long time ago with a bio team of researchers from the south of France who had maybe this crazy idea that maybe we could find enzymes who have activities on plastics. Activities mean being able to, uh, um, to depolymerize plastics and go back to its basic components. And we've been a long way through. Uh, after 12 years of activities, we have a lot of patents, 53 families of patents, 336 titles in the world. We are about 120 people, uh, mainly scientists and industrial people. Um, and we have tried to manage a good diversity with 44% women. And we have two sources of revenue today, and we are expanding that. Um, the idea is to find solutions, enzymatic solutions, for most of the plastics we use in our common life. Um, and obviously, we don't intend to remain French. We, uh, we want to expand and, uh, um, and deploy our technology everywhere in the world, everywhere where, where plastics are used, which means everywhere. Uh, so there is a market potential everywhere in the world. So let me um, size a little bit the problem of plastics pollution. Um, we all face a, a huge challenge. By the way, today in Paris, there is a second round of worldwide negotiations uh, of um, the, the different governments trying to find solutions for the plastic solu uh, pollution. We produce currently 460 million tons of plastics every year on Earth. Uh, that's about doubled from what it was in 2000. And if we listen to the OECD projections, there will be 1.2 billion tons of plastics produced every year on Earth and by 2050. So plastics is pretty much everywhere in our life, not only in our bottles, but, only in our, but also in our cars, in our planes, in our, in our T-shirts, in our shoes. So there is plastics pretty much everywhere, and we are uh, consuming more and more. And most of those plastics are single-used. So we, uh, we have a huge tons, uh, quantities of waste to eliminate every year. 353 million tons are produced of waste every year. And it's not true that it's currently recycled. The vast majority of plastics we throw are incinerated, landfilled, or unfortunately uh, end up their life in the oceans or in the rivers. There is uh, different estimates, but between 9 and 14 million tons of plastics thrown in the oceans every year. And unfortunately, the vast majority of those plastics goes in the, in the bottom, don't stay on the, on the surface. Um, and it creates a lot of nano, nano and, uh, and micro plastics pollutions that are a huge issue for the biodiversity. So there is a need to do something. How to get from less than 10% of the plastics recycled to 100% of the plastics recycled? And this is what Carbios is trying to solve. Um, people are worried about the plastic pollution, so it's basically coming as a second main environmental issue after climate change in the mindset of uh, citizens. Uh, that's a study done on six different large countries. And 81% of the citizens and consumers we have, uh, which have been investigated, they would like to use less plastics, but they really find it difficult to, uh, to find alternatives in their life. And there is also not really good alternatives. When you use glass, for instance, instead of plastics, you need 23 times more CO2 than when you use plastics for the bottle. When you use wood it's for, your, uh, for whatever, it's four times less more CO2. When you use cotton instead of uh, polyester fibers, it's 1,400 more water than when you use plastics. So alternatives to plastics are not easy, and, and they don't exist, really. So. Um, so the, the key idea of Carbios is how can we make plastic and textile enter truly in a circular economy? And I have a short video to try to explain what we are doing. So if you could, I'm not sure if I display the video. Maybe. Yes. Every year, 350 million tons of plastic are manufactured worldwide. 
Plastic is a functional material with difficult to replace properties that has a problematic end of life. Today, more than ever, it's critical to innovate to offer plastics an end of life that is respectful of the environment. Carbios, a French company, is a pioneer in the development and industrialization of biology-based technologies to rethink the end of life of plastics and textiles. Since it was founded in 2011, Carbios has successfully combined the world of biology and plastics. After just 10 years, Carbios has now 41 worldwide patent families and two concrete solutions to reduce plastic pollution. Our scientists have created a one-of-a-kind enzymatic process that allows PET, the world's second most commonly used plastic, to be biologically recycled. Unlike conventional recycling processes, our revolutionary approach returns to the fundamental components of PET. It allows all types of waste to be recycled, including transparent, coloured and opaque plastics, complex packaging and textile fibres. It's now possible to make a transparent water bottle from a t-shirt or from a used coloured shampoo bottle. Our teams have also developed an enzymatic additive that accelerates the biodegradation of PLA, a plastic of vegetable origin. This additive is directly integrated during the packaging manufacturing process and allows the packaging to become 100% compostable, even at room temperature. The trays, films or packaging can then be thrown away with everyday bio-waste in a composter and fully biodegrade without residue or toxicity. Carbios provides clear solutions to plastics producers and major brands that have made ambitious commitments with short timelines in terms of sustainable materials. We are the first and only company in the world to develop biological technologies on an industrial scale to rethink the end of life of plastics. At Carbios, we give value to waste that currently has little or no value. Thanks to our two innovations, plastic and textile waste is now a precious raw material and is entering the circular economy. We know that there is still much to be done to innovate and rethink the end of life of other polymers. Our ambition is clear. Pursue the development and industrialization of innovative biological solutions to create an end of life for plastic that is more friendly to the environment. This challenge is taken up by all of our employees, committed on a daily basis to optimizing the life cycle of plastics and textiles in the service of a truly circular economy. Okay, so uh, the way we have developed Carbios is, to, uh, is through partnership. Of course, a, a small company can not solve by itself the, the, the huge question of plastic pollution. So the way we have started is to talk with brands and say we have an innovation. We are able to do enzymatic depolymerization of plastics. Are you interested? And one of the first brands we came on board is L'Oréal. L'Oréal is our largest shareholder. And they came on board quickly to say, OK, we, have, we use a lot of PET in our cosmetics um, components, so we want to partner with you. Then they were followed by Nestle Waters, PepsiCo, and Suntory, where we signed consortiums, and basically those companies help us on our R&D. And last year, we also did the same in the, in the textile world, because some big brands, uh, they also want to uh, change their way to, uh, their approach to circularity. So we started with Patagonia, I think everybody's familiar with Patagonia, and soon joined by Puma, um, Salomon, On Running, and PVH Group. PVH is a group owning Tommy Finger and Calvin Klein. So, so those brands are partnering with us to develop uh, and to demonstrate uh, our capacity to, uh, to do a true circular plastics or true circular fiber. Um, in our shareholders, we have also Michelin, because Michelin use, and we are located in the same cities and Michelin, we are in Clermont-Ferrand. Uh, Michelin use also, and the tire industry generally use uh, plastics in the production, polyester fibers, and we had also L'Occitane as a shareholder uh, joining us. Uh, we've been recognized by key institutions like uh, Solar Impulse, uh, and, um, and uh, this year we joined the Ellen MacArthur Foundations, uh, really to uh, help Ellen MacArthur 
uh, on their um, path to uh, ending with or to solve plastic pollution and textile pollutions. We have a lot of support from governmental institutions. And the way we have designed our uh, R&D is uh, through academic partnerships. So we have partnered first with uh, large academic partners in, in France, uh, INSA, uh, CNRS, and, and um, INRAE. And then we also uh, partner now with uh, uh, academic uh, work everywhere in the world, with the Munich University, University of Chicago, uh, University of um, um, Seoul, so we, we try really to uh, create a consortium of academic work around the, around the issue. So in 2023, because we are designing enzymes, but we are not producing enzymes, producing enzymes in a large scale is a very specific work. We signed a partnership with a Danish company named Novozymes. Novozymes is the largest enzyme producer in the world. They do about 50% of the enzyme productions. And Novozyme has decided to do the plastic uh, enzymatic work with Carbios exclusively. So we signed a, a strong, very strong partnership with Novozymes. And yesterday we confirmed a partnership with Indorama, which is the largest plastic producer. It's a Thai group. They do about 7% of the plastic production in PET in the world. And they signed a partnership to build with us the first plant we are building in, in France. So what is, what is our job? Our job is to successfully uh, mix two science. One is the enzymatic development, and the second is plast plastic science, and to find the combination. And why? I'm going to explain it on the, on, the next, uh, on the next slides. The work we do is to find the right key for the right lock. So when you have a polymer, you need to find the right enzyme, which is going to have the activity of depolymerization, so basically to break down the plastics into its basic components, and that's exactly the job we are doing. From any kind of plastic waste or textile waste, we go back to the basic components of the plastic, which we call monomers. And that's what our enzyme is doing. We don't need huge quantity of enzyme. We use basically one for 1,000, so one kilo of enzyme for one ton of PET waste is sufficient. So it's a it's very, uh, very efficient process. And from then, we have invented, you see that in the video, two business. One is recycling, recycling petrol source plastics, and the other one is accelerate the biodegradation of plastics, and this is uh, what we are doing on biosource plastics on the PLA. So in 2020, uh, our, uh, our work has been recognized by Nature. We, did the, we were the first biotech to, uh, the first, sorry, French biotech to do the cover page of Nature, and our work has been exposed in, in Nature in 2020. And from them, we started to have a lot of partnership, academic partnership, because a lot of uh, uh, people start to work on enzymatic solutions now. OK, so um, moving from PET and PLA that you saw in the video, we, uh, we are starting to tackle the other families of plastics. We don't have yet uh, the solutions, but we are working actively on other plastics. We are working actively on polyamides, uh, nylon is a polyamide, so uh, polyamides are extensively used in, um, in automotive and in the textile industry. And we also uh, are working on the large, largest family of plastics, which we call polyolefins, uh, which are the polyethylene and polypropylene, which is uh, about 30% of the plastic we use, very widely used in many uh, food, um, automotive, uh, airplanes. Uh, so uh, the, the next uh, frontier for us is to have an enzymatic solution for polyolefins. So why, are we, why do we believe we are a game changer? Uh, first, we can do a true circularity in every industry. Uh, plastic is everywhere, and if we take a polyester and, and PET, it's in any industry. In your home, in your furniture, in your cosmetics, uh, in your apparels, uh, with uh, outdoor uh, sportswear, uh, automotive, the airbags in the car are polyester fibers. The seats in the car are polyester fi fibers. The beverage, of course. So everybody thinks plastics with bottles, but bottles are actually a very narrow part of the plastics. The food, the food trays, uh, we estimate that there is about half a million tons of food trays produced every year in Europe. And none of that is recycled today. Everything you throw in your yellow bin, I think it's a yellow bin in Germany, Everything you throw in your yellow bin as food trays is going to be burned, or incinerated, or landfilled. There is no solution. We can recycle food trays um, or industrial packaging. 
So what, what is going to be the change in the market? That was a figure we showed a year ago. We are refining those figures. But basically, we are going to move from a market of 10% recycled plastics, 90% petro source, to a market about 50-50 by 2035, 2040. Why is it that? Because there is a regulation. In Europe, in 2025, 25% of the plastic needs to be recycled. That's a regulation. And it's going to be 65% by 2040. So the market is changing dramatically. So basically, the producers of plastics need to shift from petro source to recycled plastics. And they didn't do, do that very urgently. And the chance we have is we are the only ones. So, so that's put by regulations. So, so as many, many times, Europe has uh, shown the way. So Europe is putting very strong regulation on plastic uh, recycling incorporations. But it's copied uh, in California, in New Jersey, and there is a third state where the, the legislation is copied right now. And, and it's going to be copied also in Asia. Uh, many India, China are, are trying to do similar kind of regulations to incorporate more and more recycled plastics. So uh, beyond the regulations, there is a brand commitment. All the big brands, whatever you take the ones which are partnering with us or the other ones, everybody has taken huge commitments on using more sustainable materials, raw materials. So here we have four examples um, of brands with we, which we have been talking to. But all the brands are taking commitments to use more and more recyclable or sustainable plastics in their, uh, in their uh, products. So we have this trend. And this trend is uh, public. I mean, those commitments are shown. If you take the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's reports, you have 200, the 200 largest brands in the world have put public commitments of when they will be uh, using 100% rec recycled plastics. So it's not something which is uh, hidden. It's, it's, it's a true commitment from the big brands. So why do we think we have a unique proposition? So we are the only ones to produce uh, the, the monomers that are used by over 90%, 95% of the plastic producers. We produce terephthalic acid, so I'm sorry to be a bit technical, and terephthalic acid is a basic component of PET in 95% of the, of the plants. And we are the only ones to do that. So we are the only one to do a depolymerization going back to terephthalic acid. All the other processes go back to different monomers. So we are com uh, totally compatible with the existing industry, totally plug and play. As I mentioned already, we can use any kind of waste. So from a t-shirt, we will do a transparent bottles. From a transparent bottles, we will do a cosmetic bottle. So it's totally versatile. And uh, when today only 28% of the waste are recyclable by mechanical technology, conventional technology, we are able to accommodate 100% of the waste in our processes. We do circularity per industry. So it's quite easy in bottles. You can easily do a bottle to bottle recycling. It's impossible in many industries. Today, when you buy a recycled T-shirt made from recycled fibers, it's made from bottles. It's bottle to fiber. And that's not possible to continue that way. The, the big players which are working with, with us, they want to do a fiber to fiber. So they want to do a circularity per industry. The big brands in the automotive are telling us we want to do Recycling our own airbags, our own seats. They don't want to use bottle of water to do airbags. That would not be uh, making a lot of sense. So there is a circularity per industry with our technology. We have enhanced circularity. I will mention that just after. And most importantly, we go back to virgin quality. When today you buy a recycled bottle, it's going to be probably darker. It's going to uh, be probably uh, uh, more, um, you need more materials to produce this, these bottles. And, and last but not least, there will be some impurity in the plastics because you cannot recycle mechanically without eliminating all the impurity in the plastics. We eliminate 100% of the impurity. We have no bisphenol, we have no bad products in our products because we go back to the monomers. And because we go back to the monomers, we produce a plastic which is the same quality as a virgin plastic, and the new plastics. Okay, and the point which is extremely important in our marketing is we save about half of the CO2 emissions, uh, probably more. It's a very conservative, uh, very conservative figure because to work with enzymes, we need to work at low temperature. We, uh, our process works between 60 and 70 degrees Celsius. 
competitive uh, recycling um, uh, technologies use generally more than 200 degree de Celsius. When you want to recycle glass, for instance, you need to go to 1600 degree Celsius. So we have a very low energy consumption in our processes, and that's very important for the CO2 impact. Okay, so, so plug and play, I, I will go back quickly on that. So com plug and play compatible with the existing industry, so we don't need to recreate with our technology uh, the, plastic, the plastic industry, we just need to add uh, our, um, our technology. So instead of using petro-source products, the, the PET producers will use our products made from waste, basically. That's a, a shift, but there is no need to recreate those huge factories of plastic production which are already existing. And that's a lot of capex avoidance, because today, to build a plastic plant, it's extremely cost, cost expensive and capex intensive. Next one. Um, I mentioned that, so basically today in the PET world, 20, 22% of the waste are recyclable, and we go back to 100% of the waste which are recyclable with our technology. What is not recyclable, I already mentioned to that to you, what is not recyclable today are the food trays, the small cosmetics, those, everything which is small components, um, and the polyester fibers are not recyclable with the current technologies. Okay, I can move. So this I already mentioned. So enhanced circularity, that's a very important point, um, and that's something we, uh, we, which is quite unique for us. Um, when you do a virgin PT, uh, single-use plastics, and it's thrown, you, you make out of raw materials only one use, you have one cycle. When you do a conventional recycling, you do two or three cycles, and then it's over because you have too much impurity in the plastics, and it's over, it's becoming a waste. So basically, today, we estimate the average is three, recycle, three cycles, which will be done out of uh, the material. With our technology, because we are able to do about 95% conversions, we estimate we can do 20 cycles. So we do, out of the same materials, 20 times the recycling. So when you calculate your life cycle analysis, multiplied, uh, divided by the number of cycles the material is going to be used, we have a very significant advantage in terms of um, LCA, in terms of life cycle analysis. So that's very important for the brands which are supporting us. As this I mentioned, um, and sorry, one point which is important, we are the only technology because it's biological which are using no solvents. And no, sol no solvents are very bad for the environment because you cannot eliminate totally solvents when you use solvents. So chemical recycling using methanolysis or using glycolysis are unfortunately polluting much more than what we are, than what we are doing. Uh, we use a, um, enzyme, and enzyme is a protein. Enzyme is very easily biodegradable. And this is the key point when we approach particularly the U.S. markets. Uh, you know, in the U.S., the companies are valuing their uh, CO2 savings uh, very strongly. It's a, it's a marketing impact. So we save, uh, today we claim 51%. We believe it could be more. So when you, when you bring a 50% uh, CO2 emission reduction to the brand, that has an immediate economical value uh, to the brands. Okay, so where are we? Uh, we have a demonstration plant installed in the center of France, which is already doing all the, all the processes. We go from the pretreatment of the waste, we do the depolymerization phase, then we do a filtration, we do a separation of the, of the monomers, and then we, we go back to the two basic components, the two basic products, terephthalic acids in a pure way, and uh, monoethylene glycol. One is a liquid, the other one is a solid, and then it can be shipped to any PET producer in the world. So basically we go from waste to monomers, and that can be shipped to any PET producers everywhere in the world. Um, this is already up and, up and running in the plant, in the demonstration plant, and we are building the first, of a, the first of a commercial plant, which will be, um, sorry, which will be, no, that's not there, which will be in the northeast of France, at the border of Luxembourg. Uh, we located this uh, plant in, the, in that place because that's at the, at the, on, the same, uh, on the same location than the largest PET producer in France, which is Indorama, our partner. Uh, but basically, uh, this, this first plant is going to produce 50,000 tons of waste. Uh, it's going to process 50,000 tons of waste every year. 
uh, that's the equivalent of two billion bottles. Uh, still small compared to the market potential, but to start with, it's already a very decent size of a first plant. So where do we go from now? We want to license our technology. We don't want to operate. We are a technology company. We are an enzymatic company. We don't want to operate ourselves the 100 or 200 plants that we want to install in the world. So we want to have uh, a licensing approach. And we are talking to uh, five kind of uh, uh, industries. Uh, we are discussing with, of course, the first ones which are interesting in our technology are the PET producers. Um, and there are PET producers in uh, 50 countries. So it's, it's, a very, uh, it's a very capex intensive industry and they need to find solutions on how to use their assets. We are talking also on big chemical groups which are using terephthalic acids in other products and we want to have uh, recycled terephthalic acids. We talk to the waste management companies because the waste management companies today they do their money on incineration and landfill. But guess what, this business is over. It's, it's over in 10 years from now, there is no landfill and no incineration allowed. So they need to do something with the waste. They collect the waste, they, they know the waste value, but they need to find solutions. So they are very interested in our technology too. Some brand owners are looking at our technology. So already some brand owners are recycling their, their, their plastics. Coca-Cola is doing that in certain countries. Uh, Lidl in Germany is doing that. Uh, the Lidl has bought some mechanical recycling technology. So some brand owners are more and more starting to think on how to recycle their own products. And we have in, uh, in, certain, um, in certain rich country, I would say some sovereign funds and, um, and countries would, would like to, to invest directly in the technology. So that's what I mentioned. That's uh, the plant, the first one, how it looks like, the 50,000 tons plant. Um, and we, um, we can operate those kind of plants with, uh, it's not very labor intensive. With, about, with less than 70 people, we, we make this plant of 50,000 tons of waste operating. So the plant, the first plant is going to start in 2025. We have already started the permitting, um, the permitting process. Uh, yesterday, I had the chance that uh, the, the French president made a, an announcement on LinkedIn on, on Carbios and saying in, he wants to support Carbios. Uh, that was the day after he gave us 54 million euros of subsidies. So, so that, that was very helpful for us. And, and today the stock is, uh, is up very significantly. Um, and the plant will be uh, starting construction by the end of, uh, of 2023. So I mentioned Novozymes because that's part of the equation. I mean, we cannot be in enzymatic recycling without producing large-scale enzymes. So for 50,000 tons plants, we need 50 tons of enzyme, basically. But when we will be selling 1 million tons of, uh, of uh, plastics, we, we need a significant volume of enzymes. And the only producer in the world which can do that is Novozymes. Novozyme has operation in 16 countries. They have 50% uh, of the market. And they were the only ones interested in, uh, oh, capable of doing that. So we signed a, a strategic partnership. We work exclusively with Novozyme, but it works the other way around. They work exclusively with Carbios. So it's a very strong barrier uh, to entry uh, because we are the only ones being able to have this uh, partnership with, with Novozyme. And it's a very long term partnership. Okay, I will pass this one. So, how are we going to? Uh, to, um, to live and how are we going to value these assets? Because we have the IP, we will have one plant, but that's not sufficient to live long run and to, and to finance. So in the licensing model, we have different stream of value. The first thing when we license, we have upfront fees where, the, where the, the future investors is paying us a fee to get access to the technology. And then we get royalties on the enzymes. Of course, it's our enzyme development. So the enzyme is going to give us a royalty um, the enzyme is produced and sold by Novozymes, but on every kilo of enzymes, we receive a royalty. And then we, uh, we capture also some premium royalties from the licensee, because they sell with a, a slightly higher price. So we get a kind of revenue in a recurring way of a royalty to the, to the, to the, to the licensee. It's a very profitable model. We just need to have capacity installed quickly so that we can make it turn. So beyond PET, I mentioned uh, in the video that, uh, that you saw that we have other work and we work on biosource plastics. So biosource plastic is very small huh, compared to petrosource plastic. 450 million tons of 
plastics overall, only two million of biosource plastics. So when you put at scale, it's a very limited market, but still there is a market. And the singularity of biosource plastic is most of them are not biodegradable. So you could not imagine that, but I discovered that joining Carbios, most of biosource plastics are not biodegradable at normal temperature. So that's what we try to change. We said, okay, there is a problem. Consumers are buying a product and they say, oh, it's great, it's biosource. Yes, but it's not biodegradable. So how can we help that? So we, uh, we try to incorporate some enzyme inside the biosource plastics and to help the biodegradation. And today we have managed to do that with the PLA. The PLA is one of the most, fa uh, most commonly used biosource plastics. It's used in, uh, in chips, in uh, yogurt pots, in uh, coffee capsules, which are in plastics, not the aluminum ones, not the Nespresso ones, but the plastics ones are generally in PLA. And by incorporating our enzyme inside that plastics, we, we make it biodegradable at, at normal temperature. At, um, uh, there is no need to heat and no need to add uh, any kind of uh, solutions to make it truly biodegradable. Otherwise, if you throw a PLA waste, it will stay for decades in the nature and will never be biodegraded. Okay, so that's what we show in those videos. I'll go quickly. Okay. So PLA, on the PLA, our solutions will start, unfortunately, we, we wanted to start in Europe, but it takes two years to get food authorizations in, in Europe. So now that our technology is ready, we will start in the US with a couple of big brands which are going to use our products at the end of this year or beginning of next year um, because uh, the home compost, home compost uh, la label is a significant label for those, those brands. If you have a biodegradable product, but if it's not home compost, you can be uh, reinsured that it will never biodegrade. So you need to have biodegradable and home compost to make it truly uh, a, a, a value added for the consumers. Okay, and as I mentioned earlier, so uh, the PET is our market today. The PLA is going to be our second market to, um, um, beginning of next year. And the midterm for us is to access the largest family of plastics. We have selected polyamides, poly polyolefins, but we will look later on on um, PVC, uh, polystyrens, and, uh, and even natural rubber because that, there could be some access there. Um, but we go step by step. Each, each of them is a, is, a very, uh, is a very significant market, so we need to go step by step. By the way, you need to know that the polyolefins, polyethylene and polypropylene, which is the largest plastic family, have very little capabilities of recycling. There is a little bit of pyrolysis to recycle that, but there is very little today capabilities of recycling. So when we will have an enzymatic solution, probably we'll change the scale of what can be done in those plastics. So I, I hope I've been um, on time. Yes, I think so. I wanted to leave you some time for questions. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah, there are 10 minutes for questions. Um, auch hier können Sie die Fragen auf Deutsch oder Englisch stellen, weil wir die Übersetzung Deutsch. da hätten. Gerne. Hello. Yeah. Uh, I have one question regarding the competitive landscape. You didn't mention much on that. You said you're the only one who's producing something like that, but I would imagine that some of the big chemical players must be very interested and in also putting a lot of effort in doing something similar. Maybe you can explain that a bit. Yes, so today, today the, the, comp the competition is, uh, enfin, if there is competition, but the, the competition is to do a chemical recycling. So if you don't use enzyme like we do, which is a biological product, you can use solvents and do uh, the same things that we do, but with, uh, with solvents. So there are two technologies on solvents. Uh, one is glycolysis, the other one is methanolysis. The big problem of those technologies, uh, beyond the fact that they use solvents, is you don't go back to the basic components which are the mostly used in the plastic industry. You go back to other monomers which are not compatible with the existing industry. So it's not compatible. That means you need to do the repolymerization part of the capex investment, and you basically double the price of the plants. So that's... Uh, that's a uh, not very competitive technology, I would say, in terms of mindset. But there are some actors on that. The largest one has been mentioned by my predecessor is uh, Eastman, uh, is one of the largest methanolysis players. Um, and the technologies which are called 
chemical, but which is pyrolysis. Basically, you burn the plastic at very high temperature, and you get a little part of materials out of that, less than 40%. So it's not very circular, but there are some, uh, some pyrolysis technology. The most advanced in terms of transformation and the, and, the, and the most competitive in terms of capex usage is our technology from far. Okay, there's another question on the top. Yes, uh, thank you. Very interesting presentation. Um, just a few small questions, actually. The first one is, if I buy your material to make plastics, how much more expensive is it than if I call up BASF to get the same pallets to make whatever <laughs> bottles out of it? I'd be, I'd be very interested. Second short question is, what kind of waste do you generate in your process? Because one thing that I struggle with, your picture there where the plastics go in and there's this enzyme and then the different components come out. I'm not a biologist or chemist or anything. Is this like a living being that will sort of need some kind of you know, energy or what is, what is the major input into the process? And does that enzyme die in the end or do you, do you, can you use it kind of forever? I, that, such, uh, uh, and if you could explain just a little bit, sorry, it's a yes, wide yes, no, field. No, absolutely. So first of all, the enzyme is not a living body. Eh? The enzyme is a protein, it's a catalyst. It's made out of bacteria or fungi, but it's not a living body. So it's a very stable environment. So the enzyme is not living. It's a protein and it's going to be eliminated uh, very naturally in the, in the cycles. We get about 2% of waste today in our process, two to 3% of waste which are generally the, the most important ones are the pigment of colors. When we use a, a, a colored t-shirt or a colored bottle, we need to eliminate the pigments of bottles, uh, of the pigments of colors. So, so we get two to three percent, and that's valorized in, the, in, the, um, in incineration. So basically, that's a very good combustible for incineration. That's two to three percent of what we enter in the, in the process. Your first question was uh, the price. About the so, price. Yes, so today, recycled plastics is roughly Today, already 60% mechanically recycled plastic, so low quality recycled plastic, is today sold about 60% above virgin petrosource plastics. So that's already a reality of the market. And it's going to increase. Uh, the reason it's going to increase is there is not enough bottles to recycle. So there is a very huge pressure on the price of uh, bottled waste. Um, today, a price of bottled waste is more expensive than the price of a, a ton of uh, virgin bottles. So that's already the case. And that trend creates for us a huge, tremendous opportunity because we go and access to the waste which are much less expensive. When you buy food trays, it's about five times lower in terms of cost to bottles. When we buy uh, very small components of plastics, it's even less and textile is very cheap. So we buy our waste about five times lower than the mechanical recycling. So our process is more expensive to produce, but the waste is a huge advantage. So we have the competitiveness coming from there. We believe that by 2025, 2026, we'll be at the same cost of production than the mechanical recycling by this waste advantage. And then we'll probably be able to extract a premium because we sell a plastic which is virgin quality, virgin quality light. So we do, the, the premium depends on the industry. Yeah? So when we sell to uh, Patagonia our technology, uh, uh, even with a premium of 100%, uh, it's impacting 10 cents on the t-shirts, which is retail 40 euros. So, so the, we have opportunities to sell higher price in the luxury goods, in the cosmetics, or in the textile than to uh, Coca-Cola or, or Pepsi-Cola. But um, the price premium depends on the, on, the, on the player. Did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. A circular economy needs incentives at each stage. If I want to remove all the plastic that is available in the world, I need to pay people to bring it back. How much would you estimate you have to pay per kilogram of plastic waste to complete the circle? Yeah, um, well, today in, in Western world, a ton, I would say, uh, so you're, I'm talking Europe, not Asia, Europe and, and, uh, and US, a ton of waste for bottles is already valued 1,800 euro per ton. So it's already a significant value. So does it go away in the right pockets? I'm not sure. But uh, if we create an economy where there is a little bit of incentive of to people collecting, uh, we could definitely probably uh, collect much more waste. One of the issues I've got is food trays, for instance. I've, I just got the example of France, but we produce every year in France 100,000 ton, 100, tons of food trays. Okay. Uh, 
okay? None of them are recyclable. They all go to incineration. We talk to the French community to say we want to, uh, we want to get that back, and they're ready to give that back, and they commit only to 15,000 tons. So only 15% of the waste is going to go to us. Uh, we say it's, it's too low, you need to, uh, to increase that, that le level. So we need to give a little bit more value to that waste so that it will come back to us. 10% of the plastics are recycled. We have a huge opportunity in front of us. The 90 remaining persons have zero, zero value today. So we need to, uh, we, need, we have enough feedstock. The question is to collect them. <laughs> okay, one last question. Thank you very much, Mr. Lando. Um, we are um, invested in our big fund. We are invested in, in Occitan. Um, I saw it's uh, uh, your client. <laughs> what our shareholder, shareholder today. Ah, client, our shareholder. Uh, so what do you exactly um, to get, what are you doing exactly together with Occitan? Or yeah. What so would you like to do? Occitan is one of the most engaged in circularity. So they said that uh, by 2025, they want to use exclusively recycled plastics. So that's one of the most uh, advanced uh, brand in terms of uh, uh, engagement. So today, because we don't have a lot of production, we need to wait our plant to have massing production, but we are going to start with L'Occitane on one of their uh, iconic uh, product, which is sold in their 3,000 shops worldwide, uh, a carbios uh, made uh, product. So, uh, and they want us to produce more. The question is to get our plant uh, up and running, but uh, L'Occitane is extremely committed. L'Oréal, I think, is the same figure, but by 2030. Uh, and all the brands are, are moving that direction. I mean, uh, at the beginning of Carbios, I think we had to knock at the door and say we are there, but now people are coming to us and say we want solutions, including big luxury brands. I mean, the big luxury brands, they have also commitments on circularity, and they want to, f to solve their, uh, their polyester fibers. They want to have their packaging in plastics, which are sustainable. So we have uh, opportunities in a lot of uh, industries. Automotives, I was mentioning at, uh, at lunch that um, the, the brands which are the most committed in using more circular products are the luxury, very high-end products. So uh, I, will not, I, I will not mention name, but you will understand a very large uh, Italian uh, sports car maker and a very large German sports car maker are calling us because they are really committed. You know, those brands have pressure on pollution and they are really committed to do 100% um, uh, sustainable cars. So even in those cars, there is a lot of plastics. <laughs> so, so it's everywhere. Your company is so important for the future. Thank you very much.